Here, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're going to read verse number 13 and 14 together. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 13 and 14. And I pray you can. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we're going to read this together out loud. So again, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Give you one more, more, one more moment to get there. That's right after the book of Proverbs. If you open up to the middle of the Bible, you'll see Psalms and then Proverbs. And then Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the very last chapter. We're going to read the last two verses. All right, and let's begin. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to get to be in the house of God. Father, Lord, thank you for all that's gone on so far, Lord, the singing. And, Lord, how we, Lord, we're deemed, how we love to proclaim it, Lord. We're glad that we're saved, born again. Lord, I pray if anybody's here, Lord, this morning and doesn't know you, Jesus as their Savior, that, Heavenly Father, you would speak to their heart. Holy Spirit, do a great and mighty work in their heart. May they trust you, Jesus, as their Savior. May they get saved this morning, Lord, and know that they, if they die, that they'd go to heaven. Father, Lord, pray for the Christians in the room. Heavenly Father, Lord, would you speak to their heart? Would you give them a truth that they need this morning, Lord? We've gone uh, throughout our week, Lord, been, uh, Lord uh, in, in our jobs, and Lord, out in this old world. And Lord, if I can be an encouragement to somebody, Lord, maybe somebody needs to be encouraged. Lord, lift it up this morning to you. I pray that, Holy Spirit, that you do that work. Heavenly Father, Lord, if anybody's here, Lord, that maybe they've had some questions, that maybe, Lord, there's, Lord, been something going on in their heart and in their mind, and, Lord, uh, Lord, they need to hear from your word and something specific. I pray that, Holy Spirit, that you'd uh, work in their heart in a special and a mighty way. Use the word of God, Lord, as, it, as only you can, Lord, in our hearts and in our minds. May you increase our faith this morning. Father, Lord, you just bless us. All that we do and say, would it be for your honor and your glory, Lord. May the message, Lord, be what you would have me to say, nothing more and nothing less, Lord. I sure do love you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. We deserve to be in hell. But thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us salvation and giving us a home in heaven. Bless the message now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, verse number 13, 14. The book of Ecclesiastes, give you a little bit of a, a history, Was if you're not familiar, was written by a man named Solomon. Now, we know that uh, God wrote the Bible. The Bible is God's word. Uh, but the Holy Spirit gave, uh, through, so through a man named Solomon, uh, this book to write. And uh, so we have the Word of God here uh, and that, that God wants us to know. But God used Solomon, this man, to write this book. If you know anything about Solomon, he was a, a very famous man. Many know him because he was the wealthiest man that's probably ever lived. He was also the wisest man that's probably ever lived. Solomon was the son of King David. Uh, in the Bible, David's the man that wrote the entire, uh, pretty much the entire book of Psalms, uh, and David was a great king. Solomon inherited a kingdom from his David, a huge kingdom, the, probably the greatest kingdom on the face of the earth at that time. And Solomon didn't know what to do. He was a young man. Uh, he, Solomon uh, gives us some insight. He prays and he, asks, he tells the Lord, he said, Lord, I am but a child. And so Solomon seeks God's face to help him to know how to rule such a big kingdom at such a young age. Solomon asks for wisdom. And so God grants his request, and God gives Solomon wisdom. The Bible says, such has never been, and such will never be. Solomon, that's why we said he's the wisest man that's probably ever lived. He was also very wealthy. God blessed him with wealth. God blessed him with gold and silver. He built probably the most beautiful building that's ever been seen. He built the temple of the Lord and in the walls there was, there was jewels and, and the place was overlaid with gold and silver and he built a temple to honor and worship the Lord uh, in a great way. Boy, Solomon had, had everything. Amen. Solomon, uh, just an incredible man that did uh, a lot in the early part of his, uh, of his reign in this kingdom. But we're going to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're going to see kind of what's going on in Solomon's life before we get into this part of the message. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. So we'll go just to the very beginning of the book there. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're going to read verse 12. Start in verse 12. The Bible says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. So this is Solomon. He's the king over Israel. 
His kingdom was centered in Jerusalem. He says, And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is waiting cannot be numbered. We're going to keep going. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. So now we see in Solomon's life, he comes to a point to where he gave his heart to search out everything. Boy, he was serving God. Boy, he was doing great. Built a temple for God. Did all of these great things for the Lord. Was real, God was really blessing him. And as you see, he said he had great estate. Boy, he, was, he just had everything. Even in, a secular, uh, even in the secular world, they'll recognize the king, Solomon. The queen of Sheba recognized Solomon as a great and mighty man. But Solomon went to where, as you see, verse 17, he said, And I gave my heart to know wisdom, and then look, and to know madness and folly. So Solomon begins to kind of stray a little bit. He's got wisdom from God. He's tried to serve God. He's given God his life. He wants his kingdom to honor and glorify the Lord. But then he begins to search out folly, foolishness, madness. And that's where we see the book of Ecclesiastes. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you, hear, you see the word vanity, which means empty. You see it many times. Solomon talks about how the, what the world has to offer, has to offer is vanity. Vain, empty, whatever, he tried everything that there was. He even turned to idols, the Bible says. He even turned from worshiping God to worshiping false gods, worshiping the trees, worshiping things that should never be worshipped, that should never take the place of God. Boy, if somebody experienced life, Solomon did. Solomon experienced all that, you could, all that the world and the devil have to offer. And still, at the end of his life, he said, it's vanity, vain. My friends, can I encourage you today? It's not part of the message. But you know, everything that the world has to offer you is vanity. Everything this world wants to give you and tell you that you can have and that you can enjoy is vain and empty. It brings no satisfaction to your life. That's why as the... Uh, as the, uh, as the uh, prodigal son, it may look good with all its glamour and with all its shine, but at the end of the day, you'll find yourself eating out of the pig pen of life. This old world wants to take you and use you for everything that you have, and then when it's done with you, throw you away and find its next victim. I've seen Christian after Christian after Christian turn to the world and think that there is something that they are missing. That's what Solomon thought. Solomon looked at the world and said, you know, maybe I'm missing something. He said, God's given me wisdom and given me wealth. He said, but I want to try some other things. I want to try some other things out. Solomon thought, maybe I've missed something. Maybe I've missed some joy. Maybe I've missed some happiness. The world looks happy. The world looks joyful. At the end of his life, Solomon said, it's vanity. Oh, I tell you, Christian, don't ever think that you're missing out. Don't be like Solomon and think, oh, I miss, I've missed out on something. I need to stop going to church for a while and, and, and get involved with some of the things that other, my other friends have gotten involved in. They look happy. I must be missing out. My friends, you're not missing out. I heard a great song this last week that I loved that said, you know, I, and it said, you know, we sure are missing out. And, you know, and I agree. I've come to the conclusion that you are missing out. You're missing out. Boy, when you live for God and you give your life for the Lord, boy, you're missing out on a life full of sin. Boy, you're missing out on being drunk all night and having a hangover the next morning. 
Boy, you're missing out on not knowing uh, what it is to uh, be addicted. Boy, you're missing out on hearing it, the doctor at the end of your life tell you that you've got six months to live because of cancer uh, from smoking your entire life. Boy, you're missing out on your children acting like the world and having their minds filled with junk. And you know what? So when the world tells me, you know, you're kind of missing out on some things. You're missing out on some joy. You're missing out on some fun. I tell them, I sure am. I grew up in a preacher's home. Boy, boys and girls would come, uh, would come to church on the bus, and they couldn't understand. I told, them I, go to, I, was, I, I told them this. I said, I grew up on drugs. I was drugged to church Sunday morning, drugged to church Sunday night, drugged to church Wednesday night. I told them my schedule. I said, we go soul winning on Saturday. They said, you do what? We go play football. And I said, well, we go soul winning, tell people about Jesus. They couldn't understand it. And, you know, they said, you know, you, you're a preacher's kid. You're kind of missing out on some things. And I remember growing up thinking... You know, Dad, I think I'm missing out. Boy, I just go down, to, go down to the side of town where they have the drugs, where they have the beer, where they have the alcohol. They have all of that. And you can see what you're missing out on. You know what I missed out on? I missed out on having a drunk daddy come home and beat my mama. I missed out on having a dad that didn't take care of me because he was too busy buying a gambling ticket. I missed out on knowing what it was to see drugs rolled in my home. I'm glad I missed out. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, had all the wisdom, but yet he didn't apply it. And boy, you can be the smartest man that's ever lived, know all the Bible that you want to, but you don't apply what God's given to you, you don't apply the Word of God, and boy, you become to make some pretty sorry decisions. And that's what happened to Solomon. Now, that's just the introduction. <laughs> what I want to go back to here is verse number 13 and 14. At the end of everything that Solomon tried, Solomon tried everything the world had to offer. And at the end of everything, look at verse number 13. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So he said, let's boil it down. Let's bring everything together and let's bring it to a conclusion. Let's make a logical conclusion of what your life should be. And look what he says. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Boy, Christian, you can boil your life down to this very thing, this very verse. You fear God and you keep God's commandments, I promise you it'll be okay. Don't, think the, don't make the world think that you've, got to miss, that you've got to try everything else. You stay in a fear of God in your life. You keep God's commandments. And I promise you, you'll have a happy life. You know, when it says to fear God, that's your attitude. Fear God, that's the attitude. Keeping His commandments, that's your actions. You're to keep His commandments. This book is His commandments, amen. Keep this word, amen. You follow God's word down to the T. You trust God's word, it'll never lead you astray. I was out at the River Fest yesterday, got to talk to a young man named Josh, gave him the gospel. He said he was saved, but he said he's just kind of been doubting God. He's kind of, he went to uh, some Methodist Bible college, and he kind of got away from the Lord, and he's beginning to question God. I told him, I said, don't ever question God. I said, if you begin to question God, I said, then you, I said you ought to question yourself. I said, God's never let anybody down. If He let you down, you'd be the first. And I encouraged him. But you know what? This old world, the devil's trying to make you question God. The devil's trying to get God's Word out of your hands so you don't have faith. You live in the fear of God. You keep God's commandments. If this book says it, you keep it. Don't let the world try to get you to go outside of this book. Amen. Somebody asked me, how narrow are you as a preacher? I'm as narrow as that book right there. We were talking today with, or I was talking this past week with another friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I told him, I said, how about in Christianity we just get as narrow as the Bible? You know, I said, we, t the problem is we've got the Bible and this book and this book and this book and this book and this book. Throw all those other books away. Just get you out in old King James and just believe God's Word. Amen. This world's, this world's trying just to get you to, to question God through its uh, purpose-driven life and all this nonsense. You just get God's book out and let your life be lived with purpose in the Bible. Amen. Ask uh, Pastor Rick about that one. He'll tell you all about it. But fear God. Number one, you ought to fear God. America would have revival if we would again have a holy fear of God. 
a respect for God Almighty. You know, we wouldn't have transgender bathrooms if America had a fear of God. If America had a respect for God's Word. When God says you ought not to do that in America, if we had any respect for an Almighty God, we wouldn't have that today. We wouldn't have the divorces that we have today. We wouldn't have all of these things that are in this world, all the sin, all the drugs, all the junk, if we just had a holy fear of God. You know why? Because there, God gives you what you need, but we try to live outside of God's Word, and we wonder what's happened. That's what's splitting our homes. That's what's splitting our families, is because we don't have a fear of God. We don't have a... Respect for God Almighty. If you, if you, if you uh, question that, then my friend, can I encourage you? Go down to the River Fest with Brother Garraway. Watch how people dress. Watch how people walk. Watch the sin and the filth that goes on in your own city. And you tell me that there's a fear of God. Boy, I tell you, America is lost. We're going down the drain. Why? Even Christians ourselves no longer have a respect for God Almighty. Boy, we need a fear of God. Never before. We need to teach our children to fear the Lord Jesus Christ. But then look, keep His commandments. Like I said, so you can put the two together. Fear God is the attitude by which you are to keep His commandments. You can keep the commandments in the Bible, but not really have a respect for God. But this is what I tell you. You can maybe be in church and, and keep the Bible down to the T. But if you don't have the right attitude, you won't be there very long. But there are many that maybe don't keep everything like they should. They're doing their best. But you have the right attitude, and I promise you, you'll grow. We can't have one without the other. You can't try to keep God's Word and not have the right attitude. But if you have the right attitude, I promise you, you'll grow. Amen. Keep His commandments. Keep them. Keep them close. Hold on to them. Don't let them go. Don't let the world tear them away from you. Don't let the world make you think that you're missing out. You keep those commandments. You hold on tight to those things. When God tells you, be in church, you keep that commandment. When God tells you, read your Bible, pray, do those things, and you know God's Word, and you know what God asks of you, you keep on to those things. And don't let them go with a holy fervor. You know why? Because look, it's the duty of of man. This is what man should do. This is what is, is this is our obligation to a savior that's given us eternal life, that saved us, that's given us a home in heaven. This is our duty just as a soldier goes and gives his life in knowing the peril, knowing the danger, knowing that he's going to face hardships, knowing that he may not return, but he wears the uniform that identifies him against the enemy, the enemy, enemy, excuse me, against the enemy and he risks his life day after day. Why? Because that's his duty that he gives to his country. Well, my friend, as a Christian, you hold your head up high and you follow God's word and you wear the uniform of, uh, that God gives you in his book and you do right and you love God. You give God everything that you've got. And you, when somebody asks you why, you tell them, it's my duty as a Christian. I don't do it because I'm just made to do it, but like a soldier, I love my country and so I'll give my life because that's the duty that I have that's driven by love. When you serve God and you keep His commandments, you have a fear of God, you do it for duty, but that duty is driven by a love for God. Now, there are some soldiers that I believe don't love their country, but they, keep, but they do their duty. But then there's those soldiers that go above and beyond what we call the call of duty that are driven by a love for their country and fellow man. It's the same with Christ. There are some that are in America's churches, but they have no respect for God. They keep the commandments. They'll do these things, but they don't have the right attitude. They do their duty, but then that's it. Boy, God wants us to do so much more, but keep His commandments. That's our duty that ought to be driven by love. But then look at that next verse. For God shall bring every work into judgment. So as a Christian, God is going to bring every work in this life to judgment. And then look there, with every secret thing. I want you to notice that. With every secret thing. God right now looks down at our lives 
And He sees every work that you do, whether good or evil. And He brings it into judgment. But He also notices the secret thing. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God determines, uh, or, or God in His Word helps us to understand that when you fear God, you keep His commandments, you ought to do it not just when everybody can see you, but even in the secret times. Even in those times when nobody's looking. God's going to bring every work into judgment, and God is doing that even now. God sees your life, and God blesses you for the good things that you do, and God will punish you as a Christian for even the evil that you do. God brings it into judgment with every secret thing. So in other words, you may come to church and look good, talk good, but when we go home, what's our secret life like? What's our thoughts like? What's our heart like? What do we do when, what do we do when we're away from God? What do we do when we're not around God? We should fear God and keep His commandments. When should we do it? Even when there's nobody watching. Even in our secret life. Let me tell you about some, th some secret things in the Bible. I, look, I looked up in the Bible some secret things. Psalms chapter 90, verse number 8. Psalms chapter 90, verse number 8. This is David. This is Solomon's dad. Look what David says. Psalms 90, verse number 8. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. See, God even knows those secret sins. God even knows those things you've not told your wife. God knows the things, the sin that you've played with that you've not even told the pastor. Remember Achan? Achan tried to get away with stealing something in secret and God knew about it. No one else did. And God found him out. That's why God says, be sure your sin will find you out. Dear Christian, your life ought to be lived by fearing God and keeping His commandments. Don't let the devil try to make you think that there's those secret sins that you can get away with. Too many Christians are living a life of secret sin, and God knows about every one of them. God sees every time, even in the privacy of your home, when you tap in that link on that computer. Men all over the country that think they're getting away with looking at things they shouldn't, betraying their wife, getting on their cell phones, being on things they shouldn't be, and sin is prevalent in this day and age through technology. But my friend, God sees it. God knows that secret sin. Don't think that your secret life you're getting away with. Dear Christian, don't let the devil trick you into thinking that you can live like, he, like you can live for God on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday you can live like the devil and nobody will ever know. God's going to bring every work into judgment. Everything you're doing, whether good or evil, God's going to bring it into judgment. God's going to judge you for it. It doesn't mean that God's going to send you to hell. You're saved, you're born again. God's given you a home in heaven. Praise the Lord for that. But on this earth... We think sometimes, well, I'm saved, I can get away with it. My friend, God says, there's a holy hand of God waiting to chasten those that are in sin. You can't come and play church and go home and then live the way you want to and think that, well, I'll be okay. God says He knows. David said, God, you've put... Look there as we, as we read, He said, our, He has set our iniquities before Thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. God is going to expose your sins with the light of God's Word. The light of God's Word is going to expose the secret sins that sometimes we think we get away with. Look at Psalms 19 verse 12 through 14. Another good verse. Psalms 19 verse 12 through 14. Look what the Bible says. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. So David said, God, I've got some secret faults. But you know what you do when you have a secret sin, you have a secret fault, and you've not been right with God, and you know that you've been hiding away from your family, and you've been even hiding, trying to hide from God like Jonah, and trying to go into the bottom of the ship and get away from everything. But David said he got it right with God. He said, cleanse thou me from secret faults, 
Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. You don't understand that secret life that you think that you're living, that secret sin, those secret faults that you hold on to, they're going to take dominion over your life. They're going to take control. They're going to grapple you and drag you away from God, drag you away from church, and they're going to take control of every aspect of your life. They'll have dominion over you. But David asked God, he said, God, cleanse me. Boy, there's something about when God convicts you and you know, you know, Lord, I've been in sin. And you ask God for cleansing as a Christian. You say, God, cleanse me. You get it right with God. You bow down in prayer and you confess that sin. And if we confess that sin, God says He's faithful and just to forgive. But let me give you a verse that will help you. Look at verse 14. He said, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Dear Christian, what are the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart? Those are the things that nobody else really knows about. Nobody else knows what you've been meditating on. Is it acceptable in God's sight? Is God pleased with the words of your mouth and the thoughts of your heart? David said, God, let those words and meditation be acceptable in thy sight. And then look what he, he recognizes who God is. He says, oh, Lord, my strength. God will help you. Boy, God can help you get victory. Dear Christian, you have a sin that you've been battling, and you say, you know, dear Pastor, I've been, I've been trying, I've been battling, I've been facing it, and I've been trying to get over it. Well, God can help you. God can be your strength. You get in the Word of God and you allow God, you be in church and you begin to allow God to move, God will give you the strength to not let that sin have dominion. And then remember that God's your Redeemer. Boy, the biggest thing about your sin is if, if you've not got it forgiven by Jesus, you've not gone to Jesus for forgiveness and accepted Him as your Savior and got it settled for eternity, you don't have any hope. You won't have victory. Dear Christian, you've got, or dear friend, maybe this room, you've got some secret sins. You've got things you know, you know that nobody else knows about, but God does. And if you're not born again, one day God will bring you into judgment for eternity for those things. God's going to have you stand before His throne one day at the great white throne of judgment. And if your sins aren't paid for, aren't forgiven, even the secret sins that you don't think anybody knows about, God's going to put it up there. And God's going to say, are your sins forgiven? But boy, as a Christian, when you get forgiveness from God, you accept Jesus as your Savior, you get born again first. Jesus pays for that sin. He saves you from a place called hell, gives you a home in heaven. Then you can begin to have victory over those secret sins. Now, Matthew chapter 6, the second thing. So we have secret sins. Boy, now here's for the encouraging part. Matthew chapter 6. Some other secret things that God says... He says, every secret thing God will bring into judgment. Well, we've looked at the evil, but Matthew chapter 6. Look at the good. Matthew chapter 6, verse 4. Look, the Bible says, That thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. God's going to bring into judgment all the works. And God wants to reward and God's going to punish. And God says here that when you give alms, and, and that alms is talking about when you give something in secret. Maybe you help somebody and they don't realize it's you. Maybe you pay for something. They don't know that you've done it. Or every time that you pray and you go to God in prayer in your closet in secret and God sees you there in secret where nobody else knows, the Bible says God will reward you openly. This is the every secret thing that God wants to reward you for. Every time you pray, you get alone. Sometimes we get discouraged and we wonder if God hears us. Is God listening? Why? And we begin to wonder if God really knows. But God says He promises that He sees you when you're praying. He sees your needs and He sees you in secret. And God will reward you for it. Don't be like the hypocrites, as the Bible says. 
They keep the commandments by praying. They pray in public so everybody can see them. But they have the wrong attitude. But as a Christian, you fear God. You have a respect for God. And you go to God in secret and you pray and you get, you get a hold of God. You ask God for those needs. You ask God to see your family saved. You ask God to help you be a witness. You ask God to give you strength. You ask God to help you in your daily life to be a better Christian. And God says, And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And Boy, we want rewards as a Christian, but we don't want to do it God's way. We want that pat on the back. Boy, you sure are a good Christian. Boy, you sure do a good job. Boy, you sure pray good. But my friend, the true test of your Christianity is not what you do in public, but what you do in secret. That's why God, I believe, put that phrase there, with every secret thing. Because God's not just concerned with who you are on the outside. When everybody's watching, God's concerned with who you are when it's just you and Him. When it's just you and God. When you get alone. And it's just you and God and your thoughts. And God knows, the Bible says, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. My friend, how's your secret life? Are you getting a hold of God in prayer? Or are you letting the devil have rule and reign in sin? How's your attitude? Do we serve God? Do we keep His commandments because we love God? Because we have a respect for God? Or are we just living the Christian life to mark off our spiritual calendar? We just show up Sunday morning just to mark off our spiritual calendar. We just go and pray and, and read our Bibles sometimes and we skip a few days here and there, but we just do it because, well, we know that we should, but we just kind of measle around with it. We just play with Christianity. God says, no, He sees even the secret things. The things that the pastor never knows about. The thing that your husband or your wife will never know. The Bible says God sees it. And God makes you a promise that He'll bring it into judgment. God sees every time, dear sir, God sees every time you turn your head when you know that some, that bad magazine's there. God sees those secret thoughts when you're, seeing, when you're sitting in front of that TV and you're looking at something you know you shouldn't. God sees that. God sees it, though, when you make that decision to respect your wife and love your wife and love God and turn that junk off. Dear lady, God sees every time when you live for the Lord in the privacy of your home, when you give God your life. God sees every time you decide to give God your life in not just how we act but in how we dress. Dear friend, dear sir, God sees it when you decide to read your Bible and pray. God sees when he, when he, and He's pleased when we choose to look like a Christian ought to look like. When we decide to be holy. When we decide to not look like the world and talk like the world. You say, what's the world try to look like? Go to Riverfest. Boy, everything's showing. Ridiculous. I had to walk down, and I thought, Lord, have mercy. Brother Garraway, I'm going to pray for you harder. You know why? This is what the world thinks. It's all fair game. God says, cover up. God says, He sees the secret things. God sees every time that you decide to look like, the, look, look like a holy, modest individual that loves God. But God says it's, He's not pleased and He's going to bring into judgment every time that we decide to let the world influence our lives. Or the devil's trying to mess with the minds of America's men. It's ridiculous. devil's after America's, the minds of America's men and Christian men by letting those ladies walk around and just nothing. Boy, my blood boiled as a pastor. My blood boiled walking around to see my city and people naked almost. Where have we gone? I'll tell you where we've gone. We don't have a fear of God. You respect God, you'll cover up. You have a fear of God, Wichita. If Wichita would get a fear of God, we wouldn't have to worry about Walmart. 
We'd have Christians walking around throwing away, throwing away that junk. We wouldn't have a river fest that you have to not, you can't take your children to because of how people dress. You know why? There's no fear of God. And because there's no fear of God, nobody cares about keeping God's commandments. Nobody cares. Riverfest going on right now. Can I ask you how many of them are in church? You know why they're not? There's no fear of God. I'm thankful you're in church. You decided to be here. That shows you have a respect for God. Half of Wichita is out on the streets right now on Douglas and Waco. Partying it up. But my friend, they're going to find out, like Solomon said, it's vain and it's empty. There will be no reward. There will be no satisfaction. The only reward that they'll get is a judgment from God Almighty. And boy, America's seeing that judgment. America's in a mess. We're about to be bankrupt. God's hand of blessing is slowly leaving this country. Slowly leaving this country. You know why? Because just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah is what America's turning to. God forbid. But you know where it starts? It starts with Christians. You're born again. You're saved. Why is it a difficult, so difficult to fear God, keep His commandments? God's given you salvation. You have Christ living on the inside. You have the Holy Spirit of God. I heard a pastor say one time, he said, he was, uh, or I didn't hear him say, I read it. And he said, you know, he said, I've come to the conclusion, I'm not going to pray anymore that people make decisions they should have already made. He said, people come and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? He said, no. Just do it. You know, we... We get to the point where we think, well, I'm going to have to pray a little while about it. God told you to do it. Just do it. So Stan, you're in the Air Force. The Air Force comes up to you and tells you to do something. You tell them, well, I'm going to pray about it. What do you think they're going to tell you? <laughs> they don't care. You know why? It's your duty. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, God's the same way, I believe. God looks down and says, you ought to do this. And we as Christians go, well, God, I, I'm going to pray about that. You think God's happy? No, because God says, I told you to do it. Just do it. That's your duty. We have a duty to God. Amen. But my dear friend, like I said, if you've not trusted Jesus as your Savior, then it doesn't matter how hard you try. You're never going to be able to keep God's commandments. You're never going to be able to get victory. You're never going to be able to really know God in a greater way. Because the first step that it there is for any person is salvation. We need to be saved first. You know, the hope for America, like we said with Brother Garraway, is giving people the gospel, giving them an opportunity to trust Jesus to save them. Because, my friend, because of our sin and all the secret sins that God knows about, we're going to have to spend eternity in hell if we have to pay for them. Like I told Josh, I said, Josh, you know, all those sins that you do and all the sins that you don't think anybody knows about. I said, God knows about. And God says one day you're going to have to pay for those sins in eternity in a place called hell. I said, but if you'll go to Jesus and you'll accept Jesus as your Savior, I said, Jesus promised that He would give you the gift of eternal life. A lot of times we get this backwards. We, we don't want to accept Jesus and what He did for us on the cross to get us to heaven, but we want to try to live the Bible way. That's what Josh was confused about. That's why he didn't get saved. He was trying to live God's Word. And I told him, I said, you know, your problem, Josh, is you don't know the author. I said, you've never been saved. You've never been born again. That's what Nicodemus' problem was. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, and he lived the, he lived the Word of God. He lived the law, but found still no satisfaction. You know why? He'd never, he didn't know Jesus. Boy, dear Christian, if maybe you've been living the Christian life or you've been trying and you know, it doesn't seem to be doing what you thought it would. Maybe you need to reevaluate salvation. Now, I'm not trying to make you doubt, but you know, sometimes we don't get to know God the way we should because we don't know God. Amen? Starts with salvation. Don't try to live the Christian life without being saved. Starts with trusting Jesus. Amen? Being born again. Are you born again today? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? If not, then can I remind you, as it said there as we close, 
that every secret thing God will bring into judgment. And the worst judgment that God will pronounce on your sin is an eternity in a place called hell. The worst judgment you'll ever face, you listen to me, worst judgment you'll ever face is eternity in a place called hell. And the only way to get out of that is not to keep God's commandments, but it's to trust Jesus as your Savior. You see, we can live the Bible. We can do right. We can do these things. Why? Not, be, not to be saved, but because we're saved. Can I encourage you? Maybe today you don't know if you died, you'd go to heaven. Come forward at the invitation time. I'd like to give you and show you from God's Word how you can trust Jesus as your Savior. Like those men that you saw Brother Garraway talking to, put a thumb up. You know, they don't look like they were in church very much. But you know what? I promise you they'll be in heaven. You know why? Because it's not about how you live. It's about trusting Jesus. We've got to get America out of this mindset that if we don't live right, then we're not going to heaven. Brother Johnny and I talked to a lady for almost 25 minutes yesterday. She was Catholic. And she said, you know, if you don't live right, you can't go to heaven. I took 10 verses to show her how God says eternal life is a free gift. And she said, well, you know, we believe you have to earn your way to heaven. My dear friend, I pray for that lady that she doesn't die in the next couple days because she'll split hell wide open. What do you trust again? But dear Christian, maybe you're saved. Maybe you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. And you know what? Fear God. Keep His commandments. And you live the Christian life 24-7. Don't live just when it's convenient. Live because it's a conviction. Live when the secret, live even in your secret life. Give it to God. Never get tired of serving God. Serve God when no, el no one else is watching. But remember this that when God sees you live the Christian life, not just in public at church, but when God sees you go home and you live for the Lord, boy, there's a reward. God was pleased with that. Kind of like your children, and then we'll be done. I'm sorry, I've said that five times. Well, I'm a, I'm a good, uh, I'm, a, I'm a copy of my dad. My dad will tell you that too. It's like your children, you know, when your children please you and they do what you ask them to do. And sometimes, you know, you ever done that where you spy on your children through the window? You go, what are they doing? Let's see if they'll do it. You ever done that? Well, hold on, honey, let's see how they do. And then when they do it, you go out there. Good job. I remember my dad used to do that. Boy, dad would reward me. He'd be like, good job. Let's go do something. You didn't know dad was watching. Well, you know, God's doing that in your spiritual life. God says, oh, you did good at church. What do you like at home? You think, well, nobody's watching. Click. Click. My friend, there's a eyes. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good and God wants to know do you live for him just because it's convenient or do you live for God by conviction amen let's pray Heavenly Father Lord sure do love you Lord I pray that the message was a blessing Lord I know you spoke to my heart Lord in studying this Lord two weeks ago Lord you gave this message to me and Lord I know how much I needed it Lord to remember that Lord it's Lord, as a pastor, you can't just live like a pastor in the pulpit. But Lord, we've got to be Christians everywhere we go. God, would you help me to be that way? Lord, I know I need to work on it. That Lord, everywhere we are, every place that we go, your eyes are there beholding us. May we, Lord, constantly live for thee. Lord, may you help America. God, may you help the city of Wichita. May we be Christians that could influence this city for the cause of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for these people, Lord, their love for you, their willingness to be here. Thank you, Lord, for their patience, Lord, and being here, Lord. Uh, Lord, I believe I've taken uh, more of their time. But thank you, Lord, for their love for you and their patience. Pray that you'd bless now the invitation, Lord. May we make some decisions, God. May we come forward at the altar, Lord, and make a decision, Lord, about what we've heard today. May you bless the invitation time. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's all stand.